Well, hello, fellow pilots. I'm John King. And I'm Martha King. Welcome to Practical Piloting. In this course, we're going to give you a basket full of helpful hints, rules of thumb, tricks of the trade, all things to make your everyday flying safer and easier. And we hope you'll find some of these rules of thumb might make in-the-head calculations a little easier. I think that's really why flying does seem to get easier with experience. You learn these shortcuts. Things do just seem to fall into place with less effort. But now, let's get started. And to do that, John's going to lead off with a hint on how to make your airplane fly faster. Let's talk about some rules of thumb. You know, having rules of thumb handy will reduce the time needed to make calculations in flight planning, but maybe more important, knowing these rules of thumb is going to make your workload a lot less if changes are required while you're in flight. So that's going to be a big help. Besides that, they make great material for hangar flying conversations. Enough of this nonsense. Let you and I go to work, and let's talk about the first rule of thumb. And that is, let's assume that you're planning a cross-country trip in your own airplane, and you would like to make sure that your airplane is as fast as you can make it go while using the least fuel. How could you do that? Sounds like a great idea to me. That's what everyone wants. Well, here's one way to do it. And that is you load the airplane with the center of gravity near the aft CG limit. Now, you still want to stay forward of the aft CG limit, but if you load the center of gravity near the aft CG limit, you're going to find the airplane is faster than it would be otherwise. Let's talk about why. And to do that, let's take a look at a picture of an airplane. First of all, you need to know that most little airplanes, and almost all airplanes, in fact, are designed so that the center of gravity is in front of this line we're calling the center of lift. Now, the FAA calls that the center of pressure, but we're going to call it the center of lift. Now, if the center of gravity is in front of the center of lift, if you pick this airplane up by a string at the center of lift, what's going to happen? It's going to nose down. Well, to keep it from nosing down, almost all airplanes have an aerodynamic downforce designed into the tail. In other words, the tail isn't trying to fly up, it's actually trying to fly down. And that aerodynamic downforce in the tail keeps the airplane from nosing down. Now, the reason the airplane's designed so that it has an aerodynamic downforce in the tail is that downforce helps make the airplane stable as far as pitch and speed are concerned. Here's why. Let's assume you're flying along, and for some reason, the airplane gets a little too fast. Well, if the airplane gets too fast, there's going to be more air over this tail, and there'll be more downforce in the tail. Well, when the airplane's too fast, that's going to make the tail go down, the nose will go up, the airplane will climb, reduce speed, and return to its original speed. That helps make the airplane stable. Now, if you, an airplane, for some reason, starts to get too slow, there's less downforce in the tail, the airplane will pitch down and descend and, and pick up speed and return to its original speed. So that aerodynamic downforce on the tail is actually designed in the airplane. It helps make the airplane stable as far as pitch and speed are concerned. But you pay a penalty for it because now the tail is trying to fly down, the wings are trying to fly up, and they're fighting each other. And so what happens is because there's an aerodynamic downforce on the tail, the airplane is more stable, but it's less efficient and it is slower. So if you move the center of gravity further aft, you can change where the center of gravity is in regard to the center of lift. You can put bricks in your baggage compartment if you want to to do that. Okay, now, if you move the center of gravity further uh, aft, there's less aerodynamic downforce on the tail. The airplane is less stable, but it's also more efficient. It'll fly faster and require less fuel. If you move the center of gravity forward, then of course the airplane becomes more stable but it'll fly slower and require more fuel. So you see there's a trade-off between the CG location and the amount of fuel required and the speed of the airplane. So if you feel like you want to, by all means, have maximum speed in your airplane, what you want to do is load the center of gravity rearward. The airplane will become less stable, but more efficient and a little faster. Of course, you would never want to get aft to the rear CG limit because then the airplane can become negatively stable. Stall recovery could become difficult or possibly are probably impossible. So, for faster speed, load the CG more rearward. Here's another rule of thumb, and it's about the fuel that you're burning when you're flying in an airplane. As a rule of thumb, that you'll find that a reciprocating engine airplane will burn approximately a half a pound of fuel per horsepower per hour. Now, there's six pounds per gallon, so you can use that to figure that out. Now, let's make some sense out of this. Let's assume that you have a friend, and I mean a really good friend, and he's got a P-51 Mustang, fantastic airplane, World War II fighter, 400 mile an hour, 1,200 horsepower, P-51 Mustang. And he says, 
that he's going to give you a ride in that airplane, and all you have to do is pay for the fuel. Now, the question is, how much fuel are you going to have to buy? Well, now, remember, it's a 1,200-horsepower engine, and let's assume that we're going to fly around at 75% power instead of 100% power. After all, you are buying the fuel. So we're going to, on the average, use, we'll say, 900 horsepower. Well, the rule is 900 horsepower times a half pound per hour, so you should be using 450 pounds per hour. And 450 pounds per hour divided by that six pounds per gallon I mentioned earlier means that you're going to have to use 75 gallons an hour to get this ride in this P-51 Mustang. Well, you say, that doesn't compute. I can't even imagine a figure like 75 gallons an hour. Well, let's do the same thing for your mighty C-150, otherwise known as a Cessna 150. All right, let's take a look at it. 100, 100 horsepower, roughly, in a Cessna 150 times 65%. 65 horsepower on the average. We're going to assume that you're not going to fly your Cessna 150 at full bore all the time either. This time we're going to use 65%. So 65 horsepower times a half pound per horsepower per hour means you're going to be burning 32 and a half pounds per hour. Six pounds per gallon means about 5.4 gallons an hour. See, it works for a Cessna 150 as well as it does with a P-51 Mustang. So the rule of thumb to remember is about a half pound per horsepower per hour. Now notice that yeah, it actually varies because if you have a point where the engine is most efficient, then if you increase the horsepower out of the engine, it gets a little less efficient. And if you decrease from that point, the horsepower that you're putting out of the engine, it gets a little less efficient also. But the rule is that it hovers around about a half pound of fuel per horsepower per hour. Now, let's take a look at another rule of thumb, and that is let's assume that you want to increase the speed of your airplane as you're flying along, you'd like to know what's the trade-off? How much more fuel am I using because I increase the speed of the airplane? Well, here's the trade-off. An increase in power setting causes the fuel flow to increase more than twice as much as the airspeed. In other words, it takes twice as much fuel to go fast. Let's take a look at it. Compared to 75% power at 65% power, let's assume you've been flying along at 65% power. As a rule of thumb, when you increase your fuel flow, you're going to increase it from 65% to 75% by 14%. So you're going to have a 14% increase in fuel flow, but you're only going to have a 6% increase in your airspeed. So the rule of thumb is it costs more than twice as much to go fast. And going fast is very expensive in an airplane. Let's slow down a little bit and see what the effect is when we slow down. Yeah, well, we slow down. Let's assume we've been at uh, 75% power and we slow down to 55% power. Well, when you do that, your fuel flow is going to decrease this time by 25%, but your airspeed will only decrease by 12%. Once again, you save, if, if you want to think about it the other way around, you save uh, uh, twice the fuel by slowing down half the amount. Now, all of us have landed in a crosswind, and we realize that there's a crosswind component chart. You can figure out the crosswind component when you're landing in a crosswind. But a lot of us don't have that crosswind component chart handy in the airplane. And besides that, you have to hunt for it and whip it out. So here's a handy rule of thumb. If the wind is 30 degrees off the runway heading, then the crosswind component is one half the wind velocity. Let's take a look at that crosswind chart and see if we can make some sense out of this. Here you are with a wind 30 degrees off the nose. So you start out at the 30 degree line and run in towards the lower left hand corner of the chart until you hit, for instance, a 40 knot wind strength arc. These arcs are the wind strength and we'll stop at the 40 knot arc saying we have a 40 knot wind. Then you read right straight down from that arc and you read your crosswind component and we had a 20 knot crosswind component. So a good rule of thumb is if the wind is 30 degrees off the nose, then you just take half of the wind strength and call it your crosswind component. If the wind is 45 degrees off the nose, then you would say that uh, about three quarters of the wind is your crosswind component. For instance, we have a 40 knot wind here, we said about 28. And finally, if you have a wind 60 degrees or more off the nose, you just might as well use the entire wind as your crosswind component. So let's take a look at that rule of thumb one more time. And the rule of thumb is if the wind is 30 degrees off the nose, use half the wind as your crosswind component. 45 degrees off the nose, use three quarters of the wind. And 60 degrees off the nose, just use the entire wind as your crosswind component. Now another rule of thumb we want to talk about is the speed for hydroplaning on an airplane. Incidentally, you might be interested to know there's actually three types of hydroplaning. 
One type of hydroplaning is called viscous hydroplaning, and it's caused by the jelly-like properties of the water keep generally the nose wheel from making contact with the runway. It occurs at very slow speeds, little teeny tiny film of water, about a thousandth of an inch of water, and that's called viscous hydroplaning. It occurs at snow, uh, slow speeds. It's typically a problem to, in getting traction to make the turn off the runway after landing. It's called viscous hydroplaning. Another kind of uh, hydroplaning I like to call idiot hydroplaning because it's called reverted rubber hydroplaning. And this requires that you land and lock the wheels of the aircraft. And what happens is, the, actually you melt the tires, rubber accumulates underneath the tires, little uh, beads of reverted rubber, that's rubber that's melted and reverted back to its gummy-like state. And you actually hydroplane on steam that's caught in little pockets of reverted rubber, and that's called reverted rubber hydroplaning. It requires you to lock the wheels of the aircraft. But the type of hydroplaning that most of us are familiar with is called dynamic hydroplaning. And that occurs when the airplane water skis on the water. And that's the one that's most common and the one we're talking about here. Now, the rule of thumb is that you can figure out the speed at which your airplane will begin dynamic hydroplaning. Dynamic hydroplaning requires a relatively thick film of water, not a little tiny film, but almost standing water. So let's assume you're landing in standing water. The question is, is the airplane going to hydroplane? Well, it depends on the tire pressure of the airplane. And the rule of thumb is dynamic hydroplaning begins at a speed which is nine times the square root of the tire pressure. For instance, let's assume you're flying a light single engine airplane uh, with a tire pressure of 36 uh, PSI, 36 pounds per square inch. Well, the square root of 36 is 6. So this airplane, you multiply it times 9, and this airplane, you'll notice, will begin hydroplaning at around 54 knots. And that's a good rule of thumb. If you're flying something like a Cessna 1, 172, you'll find that it's going to hydroplane somewhere in the vicinity of 50 knots. Now, another thing I should tell you is if you land and have the wheels locked, the airplane will actually hydroplane for dynamic hydroplane a little slower speed than nine times. You might use a number of seven or some slower speed. Now, let's assume today you're flying your Cessna Citation instead of a Cessna 172. It has a tire pressure of about 100 pounds per square inch. Well, the square root of 100 is 10, so a Cessna Citation will hydroplane for dynamic hydroplaning about nine times that or about 90 knots. Now, let's assume today you're flying up in the bush in Alaska and you're flying a Super Cub with Tundra tires, these huge balloon light tires, and they have a pressure of four PSI. What's it going to hydroplane at? Well, uh, take a four PSI, square root of that is two, nine times two, and you're going to find that this Super Cub with Tundra tires will hydroplane at about 18 knots. So hydroplaning becomes a problem for airplanes with low tire pressure, not high tire pressure, because low tire pressure, you have a tendency for the hydroplaning speed to be slower than the landing speed of the airplane. You can figure out the, hydro, the dynamic hydroplaning speed for your airplane using this rule of thumb. Now, let's figure out approximate density altitude as a quick rule of thumb, and it's an easy one. To approximate your density altitude, add 1,000 feet to the field elevation for each 8 degrees centigrade above standard temperature, or they call that Celsius now, 8 degrees Celsius above standard temperature. Well, the first thing we need to know, of course, is how to figure out the standard temperature. So let's you and I see if we can't figure out the standard temperature. Well, the first thing you need to know to do that is uh, you have to know the standard temperature at sea level. And that's a case of memorizing it. The standard temperature at sea level is 15 degrees Celsius. Now, another thing you need to know is the temperature decreases 2 degrees Celsius for each 1,000 feet you go up. Now that we've got that rule of thumb, let's assume you and I are going on a trip. And let's leave from Bryce Canyon, Utah. So let's take a look at Bryce Canyon, Utah. And they're at an elevation of 7,586 feet. We'll call it roughly 7,500 feet, 7,586, something like that. Now let's go back to our rule of thumb. And we said earlier that the standard temperature at sea level is 15 degrees Celsius. And the temperature cools down 2 degrees Celsius for each 1,000 feet you go up. So at 7,500 feet of altitude, which is roughly the Bryce Canyon elevation, uh, the standard temperature starts out, cools off 2 degrees for each 1,000 feet you go up, so it's going to cool down 15 degrees Celsius. Well, it started out at 15 degrees Celsius, cools down 15 degrees Celsius. So at Bryce Canyon, on a standard day, what should the temperature be in Celsius? The answer is zero. should be right at the freezing level. Now let's take a look at what we're going to do with that information. Well, let's assume today at Bryce Canyon, instead of being freezing or zero degrees Celsius, let's assume today the temperature is just a little bit warmer than that. Let's assume today the temperature is 24 degrees Celsius. Now, the question we're asking is, what effect is this non-standard temperature, warmer temperature, going to have on our density altitude? 
Well, let's take a look at it. The temperature, instead of being zero degrees Celsius, is 24 degrees Celsius. That means the temperature is 24 degrees Celsius warmer than standard. And by the way, if you ever wonder where you're going to get Celsius temperatures, because you know that flight service stations and control towers give you temperature in, and dew point in Fahrenheit, well, you get this temperature by looking at the outside air temperature gauge on the airplane, because there is a little ring for Celsius temperatures. And we use Celsius temperatures because this rule of thumb works. And here's the rule of thumb. To approximate density altitude, add 1,000 feet to the field elevation for each 8 degrees Celsius above standard temperature. Okay, now let's go back and look at the chart we were on. We're 24 degrees divided by 8, or uh, that's 3 units of 8 degrees above standard temperature. So that's 3,000 feet. We're going to increase our density altitude by 3,000 feet. The density altitude was, or the field elevation was 7586. We add 3,000 to it, and you're going to find out your density altitude is roughly 10,500 feet. So once again, the rule of thumb is for each unit of eight degrees warmer than standard, you add 1,000 feet of density altitude. Let's take a look at the standard density altitude chart and see if this proves out. Once again, we had a temperature of 24 degrees Celsius, so you start down at the bottom of the chart, a temperature of 24 degrees Celsius, read up until you hit approximately the 7,500 foot pressure altitude line. We had to actually make our own diagonal 7,500 foot pressure altitude line, stop and make a dot. Now read off to the left and you find out, sure enough, your density altitude is about 10,500 feet. So once again, to figure out your density altitude, just simply increase your field elevation by 1,000 feet for each unit of eight degrees Celsius, temperature warmer than standard. All right, now let's take a look at another rule of thumb, and this one has to do with maneuvering speed. Now, maneuvering speed is a maximum speed at which you can make an abrupt and complete deflection of the controls without causing structural damage to the aircraft. It's a speed you would like to maneuver in severe and extreme turbulence and to fly in severe and extreme turbulence. So let's figure out how we can determine what the maneuvering speed for our airplane is. You say, wait a minute, it's real easy. You look on the placard on the panel. Well, let's assume, and there should be a placard on the panel for maneuvering speed. Let's assume today that for some reason your placard's not there or uh, you're in such rough turbulence you can't even find the placard. Here's a quick way to determine your maneuvering speed. First of all, maneuvering speed is roughly twice the stalling speed in clean configuration. So all you have to do is look at the bottom of the green arc on the airspeed indicator and find out what the stalling speed of the airplane is. Now, here's why that rule of thumb works. The official way to determine maneuvering speed is you take the square root of the load factor and multiply that times your stalling speed, and that's how you really figure out maneuvering speed. But the load factor limit for most airplanes, when I'm talking load factor, I'm talking about the load factor limit the airplane was designed to take for normal flight. For a normal aircraft, normal category, it's 3.8 Gs. Utility category, it's 4.4 Gs. Well, if you take the square root of that, square root of 3.8 g's, and I didn't know this in my head, I had to use a calculator to do it, but the square root of 3.8 g's is 1.95, the square root of 4.4 g's is 2.10. So what you do is you simply use a rule of thumb, call it two. So take the stalling speed of the airplane at your current weight, by the way, and multiply it times two, and that'll be the maneuvering speed for your weight. Now, if you were at maximum gross, you could use the bottom of the green arc on the airspeed indicator. But in real life, normally you're flying at less than maximum gross weight, so you'd have to try and figure out the stalling speed for your weight and multiply it times two, and that's your maneuvering speed. Now, I want you to notice that the maneuvering speed decreases with the decrease in the weight of the aircraft. So you should fly slower in turbulence when you're less heavy. The reason for that is the maneuver speed uh, is determined not by the wings tearing off the airplane, but it's determined by such parts of the airplane failing like the floor of the baggage compartment and the battery box holder. You get in strong turbulence, you have a tendency to have the, the baggage go through the floor of the airplane or the battery to fall through the bottom of the airplane. So you want to slow the airplane down in turbulence, and the lighter the weight is, slow it down more. And what figure to use? Twice the stalling speed of the airplane at your weight. What you're going to find is for a, a heavy airplane, one that has a lot of weight changes, the maneuvering speed will change an awful lot. Let's take a look at, for instance, once again, your Cessna Citation, and it's at sea level. Well, if the weight is at maximum gross weight for some Citations, 11,850 pounds, you'll find that the maneuvering speed is a twice the stalling speed, it would come out to 183 knots. 
But if you reduce this same airplane's weight to 7,500 pounds, and you can in a Cessna Citation because it has a tremendous amount of fuel load, now the maneuvering speed of that airplane would be 148 knots indicated airspeed. And it's going to be the same for your airplane. You should remember that when the weight of the airplane is less, the maneuvering speed of the aircraft is less. Now, here's a new subject for you. Let's assume that you want to fly at a, at a given power setting, we'll say 75% power, and you want the highest true airspeed for a given amount of fuel at that power setting. Well, to get the highest true airspeed for a given power setting, what you want to do is go to the maximum altitude that you can fly and still get that power setting. The highest altitude a normally aspirated engine can maintain at 75% power is normally 7,500 feet. Now, let's take a look at it. All right, to do that, let's take a look at this chart together. First of all, we're going to look at line number seven, which gives you 75% power. So let's take a look at the bottom of this chart now. And here we are going down to the bottom of the chart, finding line number seven. And notice that line number seven here is 75% power. And the way this chart reads is on the left is the altitude of the chart. We'll take a look at that later on. And down at the bottom is the true airspeed of the chart. And at sea level, the true airspeed of this airplane at 75% power is about 190. But notice as you go to higher altitudes, the same percent power gives you a higher true airspeed. Until in this particular case, somewhere just between six and 7,000 feet, you're going to find out that's the maximum altitude at which you can still get 75% power, and that's the maximum altitude, or that's the maximum altitude you'd want to cruise that airplane if you're looking for the most speed with the least amount of fuel, and there it is. Now you could also do the same thing for other power settings. You'll find that any given power setting, the higher altitude you go, the faster you go, until you get to the maximum altitude that you can maintain that power setting, and that's the altitude you would like to cruise to get the most speed. As a rule of thumb, depending on the induction system of the airplane for 75% power, you'll find that you're going to get maximum economy out of that airplane by cruising at around 7,500 feet of altitude. Again, you'd look at the chart for your own airplane, but six or 7,000 feet of altitude for a normally aspirated engine is the one that is going to give you the most speed for the least amount of fuel used for a given power setting. All right, now, here's another rule of thumb, and it has to do with takeoff distance. And what they want you to know, basically, the rule of thumb I'm trying to get across here is that a headwind helps you get off, but a tailwind really hurts you four times as much. Let's take a look at it. First of all, a good rule of thumb is you should decrease your takeoff distance by 1% for each one knot of headwind. That's how much a headwind helps you for taking off, 1% for each knot, one knot of headwind. Now. In, if instead you would like to take off with a tailwind, now you want to increase your takeoff distance by 4% for each one knot of tailwind. In other words, a tailwind hurts you four times as much. You don't believe it? Let's take a look at it. Well, here's one manufacturer's short field takeoff chart. Let's take a look at the notes up here. Note number two says, decrease the distance by 10% for each 10 knots of headwind. Well, let's take a look at the rest of it. For operation with tailwinds up to 10 knots, increase the distance by 10% for each two and a half knots. And that's four times as much. And once again, it hurts you four times as much. It also works for landing. So let's take a look at another manufacturer's chart. This happens to be a landing chart. But what they do is they have you coming in from the rest of the chart. And if you have a tailwind, you'd increase your landing distance by this much. Now, that notice this is with five knots of tailwind, you'd increase your landing distance by 160 feet. But if you happen to have the same five knots, but it's this time a headwind, you'd only decrease your landing distance by 40 feet. So the rule of thumb is don't take off or land with a tailwind. Tailwind, it hurts you four times as much as taking off or landing with a headwind will help you. Now, we all know that the true airspeed of our airplane increases with altitude. We usually normally use a flight computer to figure out how much the true airspeed increases with altitude. Well, here's a rule of thumb that you can store away in your head and you won't have to use a flight computer. For a given indicated airspeed, your true airspeed increases about one and a half percent to two or two percent for each thousand feet of altitude that you go up. Let's take a look at a chart that illustrates this. First of all, you can use as a rule of thumb about one and a half percent for airplanes at lower altitudes. Now across the bottom of this chart, we've got an indicated airspeed. And uh, we'll say we have an indicated airspeed of 100. Now we'll talk about true airspeeds are going across the bottom, 120, 140, and so on. And here's altitudes, 10, 20, 30, 40,000 feet of altitude. If you have an indicated airspeed of 100, and as you go to higher altitudes at 10%, you'll notice that your uh, airspeed increased on by about a percent and a half. So to 10,000 feet of altitude, your airspeed increases 1.5% for each 1,000 feet of altitude that you go up. 
But now, as you get to higher altitudes, take a look at the 2% line, and you'll see that your, your airspeed increase curves over until it actually passes the 2% line. So for altitudes between, say, 10 and 25,000 feet, you should use 2% as a rule of thumb. So the question is, how much does your airspeed increase with altitude? Up to about 10,000 feet, about a percent and a half for each 1,000 feet you go up. Above 10,000 feet, up to about 35,000 feet, 2%. And that's a good rule of thumb that you can use for an indicated airspeed to find your true airspeed without having to use a computer. Now, let's assume, old pro, you're flying along and you've gotten yourself just a little bit off course. Well, in fact, you're one degree off course and you're 60 miles from the station. You'd like to know how many miles you are off course. Well, here's the rule of thumb. One degree off course equals one mile off course if you're 60 miles out from the station. Let's take a look at a way we can illustrate this. First of all, let's assume that we're 60 miles out to begin with. Well, when you're 60 miles out from a station and you're a degree off course, you're also a mile off course. And let's talk about that ratio a little bit because it's going to help us solve a lot of other kind of problems. First of all, if you're a degree off course or you fly one degree, uh, 90 degrees from your course, the time to fly to the station is going to be exactly 60 times uh, the time that took to fly this direction. Or the distance to the station is also 60 times. So the ratio for each degree that you are here, this distance to the station is 60 times, this distance 90 degrees to the course. Now let's take a look at another drawing and we'll illustrate some of this. And we'll talk about how we're going to use this in just a minute. First of all, if you're 10 degrees off course at 60 miles out, then you're going to be 10 miles off course. So uh, it's going to be a ratio that's going to help you. Let's look at one more of them and we'll take a look at it. Let's assume that you're not this time 60 miles out. Let's assume instead that you're 30 miles out. Well, uh, if you're 30 miles out and you're 5 degrees off course, it wouldn't be 5 miles as it would out here at 60 miles. It would be 2.5 miles because it's half the distance. Now you can use all this to help you for several things. First of all, if you want to find the time to the station, well, all you would have to do is fly, we'll say, 10 degrees, 90 degrees to the station, and it would be the time to the station would be six times the distance it took you to fly, or six times the time it took you to fly those 10 degrees. Because remember, uh, each degree, it's going to be 60 times. You fly 10 degrees, it's only going to be six times the distance. How about that? That makes sense, doesn't it? Well, here's one that always makes people think they have a low IQ in the airplane. Need a reciprocal? Sure, nothing to it. Just add 180 degrees or subtract 180 degrees. But a lot of people have trouble doing that while they're flying an airplane at the same time. So let's take a look at a couple other methods besides adding 180 degrees and subtracting 180 degrees. First of all, there's the 2200 method. You add 200 degrees to the number you've got or, and subtract 20 or subtract 20 and add 20. Now, some people find that just as confusing. So let's take a look at another method. And the other method is the plus or minus 2 method. And first of all, you add 2 to the first digit and then subtract two from the second digit. Or if you can't do that, you subtract two from the first digit and add two to the second. Now, if this all sounds complicated to you, and I have the sneaky suspicion it just might, let's see if we can simplify it. Let's find, first of all, the reciprocal of 0, 076 degrees. Now, you can add 180 degrees to that and get 256, but a lot of people have trouble doing that. So, let's try the two and the add and subtract two method. First of all, from the zero, you can't subtract two, so the thing to do is add the two. So now you have two. Take the seven. Because you added two to the first digit, you're going to subtract two from the second digit. That's the rule. If you add to the first digit, you subtract from the second. If you subtract from the first, you add to the second. Since you can't subtract from the first, you're going to add to it. So you add two to the first digit. Now subtract two from the second digit, and you get 256 degrees. See? Nothing to it. Let's try the reciprocal of 325 degrees. All right, first of all, we have a 3, and you can subtract from that. So you subtract 2, and you get 1. And we have the 2 here. Now you add 2 because you subtracted 2 earlier, so it becomes 1, 4, 5, 145 degrees. Well, after about five minutes of practice uh, with this, you'll be able to do the 2 plus and minus method. And let's take a look at how this might be helpful. Now, these are just rules of thumb, and they don't work every time. So here's what I would do. If I want to know the reciprocal of 
zero two four, I'd simply add 180 degrees and I'd call it 204 and that'd be the simplest way to do that one. If you want the reciprocal of 60 degrees, once again, you can add 180 degrees and it becomes 240. I think those are pretty easy. But how about 106 degrees? Well, once again, you can add 180, it becomes 286. So the adding isn't too tough. That's pretty easy. But let's get over here to where it becomes tougher. Here's 136, add 180, it becomes 316. But now I'm having a little trouble adding 180 to 158. I can do it, but it's a little tougher. So I could take the one and add two to it, and that becomes three, subtract two, and that becomes three, and I get 338 degrees. I could have added 180 to it, but I just didn't see it right offhand, and that's one of the problems people have. Let's take 210 degrees. Well, for 210 degrees, uh, I can't add two because it becomes 400 degrees, so I subtract two, and that becomes zero, and I add two to the second digit, that becomes 30 degrees. Now, a lot of people can see this, but see the add two, subtract two works most of the time. Now, there are some cases where it seems a little more awkward. When it seems a little more awkward, you add or subtract 180 degrees. Let's try 243 degrees. First of all, 243, I subtract 2, becomes 0. Add 2 here, and it becomes 63 degrees. Nothing to it. So that's the add 2 and subtract 2 method, and those are a couple quick ways to find a reciprocal and see if that makes sense to you when you're flying an airplane the next time. A lot of times when you're looking for a reciprocal quickly, nothing makes sense. Let's talk about how to estimate your time and route. And to do that, let's take a look at some various speeds of airplanes. Now, the trick when we're working with these speeds of airplanes is to convert everything into how many miles a minute. For instance, if the airplane has a ground speed of 60, and Lord help us if we have an airplane that only has a ground speed of 60, but I, some Super Cubs, I guess, might, or a Piper Cub. Ground speed of 60, uh, your distance is equal to your time. You're making, obviously, one mile a minute. At uh, ground speed of 90, it's a little bit tougher. What you would need to do is take the distance, divide by three, and multiply times two, because it's two-thirds, and that is the time to the station. All right, at 120 knots, you take your distance and divide by two, because you're doing two miles a minute. At 150 knots, once again, it's a little complicated. Divide by five, multiply by two. Now, I recommend you divide first, because that way you're working with smaller numbers. If you multiply first, you're getting to be bigger numbers. 210 knots, to find the time and route, take the distance, divide by seven and multiply times two. And 240 knots, of course, you're doing four miles a minute, you divide by four. Now, what we're trying to say is, for your particular airplane, you should figure out in miles per minute how fast your airplane is. And it'll help you in a lot of different ways. Let's take a look at one way it's going to help you. If you've got this stored in your mind, how many miles a minute your airplane is making, things will just fall into place. Let's assume it's 32 miles, to the station, and you want to know how many minutes, and here's the 32 miles I'm getting. You want to know how many minutes it's going to be. Well, if you're doing 180 knots, that's almost 33 miles, that'd be 11 minutes. But if you're doing 90 knots, what you do is divide by three, 33 divided by three is 11, and multiply times two, and it'd be 22 minutes. So if you have stored in your mind the quick formula for your airplane, you're gonna know just how long it takes to get to the station very, very easily. All right, let's go to another rule of thumb, and this one's performance speeds. And we're talking about performance speeds now that require a constant lift coefficient or a constant angle of attack. And these performance speeds decrease by one half the percentage below gross weight. Now let's take a look at some examples. Now as we get into these examples, I want to point out that the speeds we're talking about are stall speed, climb speed, maneuvering speed, maximum range, maximum endurance speeds, and approach speeds. They're all sensitive to weight. And for instance, let's take a look at the approach speeds on a magnificent Boeing 727. So here we have a Boeing 727, and the landing reference speed at 30 degrees flaps at a weight of 150,000 pounds for Boeing 727 would be 135 knots. By the way, that speed is called V-REF, and it's 1.3 times the stalling speed of the airplane in landing configuration. It's just the same speed you should use uh, on approach in a, in a little airplane or Boeing 727, depending on which you're flying right now. Uh, now, so V-REF at 150,000 pounds is 135 knots. Well, at 120,000 pounds, V-REF is 118 knots. So the rule of thumb, remember, is half of the decrease. Well, let's take a look at it. We had a 30,000 pound decrease, and that's a 20% weight decrease. And we reduced the airspeed by only 10%, uh, according to this rule of thumb. And so 135 knots minus 13 and a half, it comes out to 121 and a half knots. That's pretty close to 118 knots. And the point we're trying to make is that works pretty well, that uh, you use half of the weight 
uh, decrease as a percentage, half the percentage of the weight, and you'll find out how much the performance has decreased. So it works out pretty well. Let's take a look at another example. Let's assume you have your airplane weighs 2,500 pounds, and let's assume the approach speed for this airplane is 70 knots. That's once again based on 1.3 times the stalling speed and landing configuration. Now let's assume this airplane weighed 2,250 pounds. The question is, what should your approach speed be now? Well, that's a 250 pound decrease. That's a 10% decrease. So what you want to do is reduce your uh, airspeed by 5%. So 5% of 70 knots is three and a half knots. And under these circumstances, 10% lighter, uh, you should reduce your approach speed down to 66 and a half knots. Well, that's just a good rule of thumb and it works for any airplane. It's just basically a matter of aerodynamics. And if you follow through, it'll work very, very well. Now let's take a look at another serious question. And that is, if you're taking off in a, a runway with a slope and there's also wind, do you take off uphill and upwind or downhill and downwind? And I can tell you personally, I've made this decision several times. And every time I make the decision, I feel like I did it wrong and I'd like to do it again differently the next time. So let's take a look at it. This, of course, depends on the runway slope and the wind. But the FAA has airport design standards for what the FAA calls utility airports. And these design standards limit the maximum slope on portions of the runway to, to 2%. That's about 1.2 degrees. So if you're operating from one of these utility runways, and it generally would be a hard surface runway, a general rule of thumb is it's better to take off into the wind and uphill if the headwind component is 10% or more of the aircraft's takeoff speed. So if the headwind component is 10% or more of the aircraft takeoff speed, it's uphill and upwind, folks. Now, you want to be careful of the terrain after you take off, because uh, if there's a big mountain in the way after you take off, then you might not want to take off upwind, uphill. Also, sometimes there's downslope winds that could affect you one way or the other. So we're just talking about the runway only. And once again, if the headwind component is 10% or more of the aircraft's takeoff speed, uphill, upwind. That's given everything else being equal. Now, let's take a look at another issue. If the maximum endurance speed of your airplane is needed and you don't know what it is, here's a quick rule of thumb to find the maximum endurance speed of your airplane. And that is what you should do is fly at the best rate of climb speed minus about 25%. Remember, this is just a rule of thumb. Now, here's why. Now, maximum endurance is the speed that lets you fly with the least power required. What you're looking for is the point that's lowest on the power required curve. Now, what this curve tells you here, across the bottom is the speed the aircraft is flying, and up the left-hand side is the power required or available to fly that airplane. This is the power available line, and this is the power required curve. And if you'll notice that maximum endurance occurs just at the, about the point where you're lowest on the power required curve, and that means you're going to be able to fly with the least amount of power. Now, for reciprocating engines, maximum endurance will be found at sea level. So where you want to do, if you want to know how to stay in the air the longest, fly as low as you can at a speed roughly 25% uh, slower than best rate of climb speed. And you'll find that that will normally put you right down here at the bottom of the power required curve. Now let's assume this time, instead of wanting to know what your maximum endurance speed is, let's assume now you'd like to know what your maximum range speed is. And once again, you for some reason don't know what it is. Well, maximum range speed, if it's needed, not known, what you can do is fly at best rate of climb speed plus 25%. Let's take a look at that. You'll find, by the way, that this speed will be pretty close to the 45% power setting uh, for your airplane. That's usually the one that's lowest shown on your range charts or tables. And so here we are with best rate of climb. And best rate of climb is that speed that gives you the greatest distance between the power required and the power available. Here's power required down here at the bottom. Here's power available at the top. And that gives you the best rate of climb. Now, if you increase that about 25%, you're going to find that due to the engine and propeller efficiencies, you're going to find out uh, best rate of climb speed plus about 25% will give you maximum range. And by the way, you can have a variance of plus or minus five knots. And you'll find it's going to make very little difference in maximum range. So a lot of people fly just a little bit faster instead of a little bit slower, just simply because it takes less time to fly that way. Now, let's assume you'd like to know maximum distance glide speed. Well, what you want to do in that case, if you don't know maximum distance glide speed, you have a solution. And that solution is, is glide at the best rate of climb speed because the maximum distance will come out 
very close to the uh, best rate of climb speed because they're both very close to the maximum lift over drag ratio of the airplane. And basically what you're talking about is when this airplane is, is gliding, you want the lift drag ratio to be at its highest. By the way, this maximum lift-drag ratio for an airplane is independent of the weight of the airplane. The lift-over drag ratio is based on the shape of the airplane, and it stays the same as long as you don't change the shape of that airplane, either by putting flaps down or by hitting a wall or a mountain and changing the shape of the airplane. So let's assume you have this airplane going down the glide path. Once again, it does not change. This glide path stays the same because that's based on the L over D ratio of the airplane, regardless of the weight of the airplane. Now you say, wait a minute, what if I have an extremely heavy airplane? Well, these don't look like Cessna 150s, but let's assume you had an extremely heavy Cessna 150. It's going to go down the same glide path as a lighter Cessna 150, but it's going to go down that glide path at a faster speed because you get your best L over D speed at a particular angle of attack. And you'll get that angle of attack at higher speeds when you're over gross weight and under speed, uh, at lower speeds when you're under gross weight. So now what you need to do then is adjust your best L over D speed based on the weight of the airplane. How much should you adjust it? Well, by half of the percent uh, increase in the weight of the airplane. So if the airplane is 10% heavier, you should adjust your glide speed by 5%. Same rule we talked about earlier. Okay, now uh, you should need to know that the minimum rate of descent in an airplane is entirely different. We're talking about the angle of descent here. If you want the minimum rate of descent, now you should glide at the best endurance speed for the airplane or something close to it. But uh, uh, in this case, we've been talking earlier about the glide distance. Now, once again, maximum glide distance is independent of weight, but the speed at which you should glide will be adjusted according to that rule of thumb, should be adjusted according to that rule of thumb we talked about earlier. Now, let's talk about approaching the land in your airplane when the winds are gusty. And we'll talk about for a light airplane first, in gusty winds, what you should do is increase your approach speed because you don't want the gusty wind to cause you to stall. How much? Well, for light airplanes, the rule of thumb is about one half of the gust velocity. For example, if the winds are 20 knots gusting to 30, uh, the entire gust is 10 knots, so add 5 knots. 20 knots gusting to 30, that's a gust of 10 knots, so you'd add 5 knots, half of, the, half of the gust velocity. Now, they say on heavier airplanes, by the way, you use a different rule of thumb, and I won't go into exactly what the rule of thumb is, but on uh, heavier airplanes, you increase the adjustment quite a bit. And the reason for that is heavier airplanes with a lot of momentum, I'm talking about jets, transport category airplanes, have much less ability to recover from changes in the wind. And those are the reasons you hear about uh, Boeing 727s and L-1011s getting caught by wind shear. They can't adjust as quickly as a little airplane. So this was the rule of thumb for the little airplane right here. Now, let's talk about using the wing down side slip method for crosswind landing approaches. Let's assume you're trying to make a crosswind landing and you're making controlled deflections. All we want to point out at this point is, as a rule of thumb, you can count on running out of rudder deflection before you run out of aileron deflection. And the reason for that is that airplanes are just simply designed so that the rudders are less effective in the final analysis than ailerons are. While we're at it, Let's talk about how airplanes are designed, and let's talk about how the manufacturer of an airplane engine recommends you lean the engine. And first of all, anytime you lean an aircraft engine, use the manufacturer's guidelines, use the manufacturer's recommendations. Now, if none are available, and an exhaust gas temperature gauge is installed in your airplane, here are the guidelines you should use. First of all, if you're an economy cruise, you first of all, you lean the mixture. And by the way, let's talk about how you lean the mixture. You lean the mixture by pulling back on the mixture control. If you have an exhaust gas temperature gauge, you watch the exhaust gas temperature, and as you pull back on the mixture control, the exhaust gas temperature will increase until you hit a point where it peaks out. If you pull back on the mixture control further, the exhaust gas temperature will decrease. This is called leaning the peak. If you stay right there, you'd be leaned at peak. Now, for most engines, and the only engine I can think of right offhand that's an exception to this is the Piper Malibu, and we'll talk about the Malibu in just a minute. But for most engines, you always want to lean on the rich side of peak. And you lean by, on the rich side of peak by richening up the mixture, pushing in the mixture control just a little bit. So as a rule, for most engines, now first of all, once we said earlier, once again we said earlier, always follow the manufacturer's recommendations. But if you don't know the manufacturer's recommendations or they're unavailable to you, as a rule, for economy crews, what you should do is lean the peak 
then richen up by 50 to 75 degrees. Shove back the mixture control until the exhaust gas temperature cools down by 50 to 75 degrees. And that'll give you economy. Uh, and it's a compromise because really what you would like to do is be on the lean side. We'll talk about that in just a minute. For maximum power, a good rule of thumb is to lean the peak, then richen up by 100 degrees. Now, once again, when you do the economy range we talked about earlier, you're going to be on the rich side of the power required curve, and you're going to find that you're going to be using more fuel this way uh, because you're on the rich side. Why not go ahead and lean on the lean side? Well, the reason you can't lean on the lean side, even though it would give you better economy over here, is that the for most engines that are not finely tuned on the induction system, some cylinders might be operating much leaner than other cylinders. And if you get cylinders too lean, you get tremendous problems. First of all, you get detonation, and that's when the fuel explodes and slams down on the piston. And detonation in just a few seconds can ruin that particular cylinder and maybe the whole engine along with it. Another thing you're going to get is just very, very high cylinder temperatures that could cause uh, problems with the engine. So that happens because not each cylinder in most engines is running at the same mixture. The engines are not finely tuned. The exception is the Piper Malibu, in which the manufacturer's recommendation is that you lean to the lean side of peak instead of to the rich side of peak. And the reason they can get away with it in the Piper Malibu is they have finely tuned the induction system so that each cylinder is to the nearest extent possible is getting the same mixture. So there's a good rule of thumb. Uh, for a best economy, lean to peak and then richen up by 50 to 75 degrees. For maximum power, lean to peak and then richen up by about 100 degrees. All right, now let's talk about operating in cold weather. And let's assume that you're operating in cold weather and you decide you want to preheat your engine. Well, what temperature should you always preheat your engine? The FAA says in an advisory circular, if the temperature is 20 degrees Fahrenheit or colder, you should always preheat your engine. Now, if you preheat your engine, should you preheat the inside of the cockpit also? And the FAA says, yeah, yes, you should. And the reason for that is if, if the engine's going to be cold and have problems, so will knobs, gauges, dials inside the cockpit, levers and things of that sort. So they say you should preheat the inside of the cockpit, and a lot of people even recommend you preheat the battery of the aircraft. Now, if you're operating in extremely cold weather, the FAA also recommends that you check for an ice-clogged oil breather and that uh, uh, you be very, very, very careful about fire when you're preheating this engine. Now, let's take a look at another point, and that is if your altimeter fails during IFR flight, how could you know how high you are? Well, you do have a backup altimeter and that is your manifold pressure gauge as an altitude guide. Well, how can I say that? Well, if you're in a normally aspirated engine, you'll find at sea level on takeoff with full throttle, you'll be pulling about 29 inches of manifold pressure. Well, why 29 inches of manifold pressure? Well, normally at sea level, when you're just parked out on the ground, your manifold pressure gauge will, of course, read whatever the ambient air pressure is. Ambient air pressure is pretty close to 30 inches of mercury. 29.92 would be standard. And as you're going down the takeoff roll, you'll find that you normally have a drop of about one inch of manifold pressure during the takeoff roll because of the induction system loss. So during takeoff at full throttle or at sea level, full throttle, normally aspirated engine, you would normally have about 29 inches of manifold pressure. Now let's assume today you've lost your altimeter and you're flying at uh, some altitude and you don't know what altitude that is, but you are in a normally aspirated engine, you have full throttle, and you're now reading 22 inches of manifold pressure. The question is, what altitude are you at? Well, if you take the 29 inches, that's full throttle at sea level, take the 22 inches, full throttle at your altitude, you'll find that there's seven inches difference, and it's about one inch for each thousand feet, and you'll find that you're pretty close to 7,000 feet. Now, that's a pretty crude way of finding out what your altitude is, but it's a lot better than not having any way at all. So once again, one inch for each thousand feet of manifold pressure drop off. One inch of manifold pressure drop off gives you a thousand feet of altitude. Now let's talk about how to take care of your normally, or actually any aircraft, reciprocating aircraft engine. And what you want to do is avoid shock cooling your engine. And to do that, you avoid uh, large rapid power reductions. Why? Well, what happens is when you have a big rapid power reduction, you cool the outside of the cylinder tremendously at a very fast rate. And of course, when metal cools, it contracts. The inside of the cylinder, the piston hasn't cooled at that rate, and there's a tendency for the cylinder to clamp down on the piston. Obviously, that creates damage. Another problem you have is when you shock cool the engine by cooling it very, very rapidly, and remember, these are air-cooled engines, and there's no way to shut the flow of air down through the engine uh, short of slowing it down. 
But if you shock cool the engine, what happens is the cylinder tends to develop cracks. You'll get cracks around the exhaust valve, sometimes near spark plugs, things of that sort. So here's what you do to avoid that problem. When you're trying to reduce manifold pressure, and this particularly applies with a turbocharged engine because they get very hot and you're at high altitudes, you re re and this is a very conservative rule of thumb, by the way, you reduce your manifold pressure by two inches initially, then reduce it one inch per three minutes. Now that takes plenty of planning ahead. You're not going to do that just automatically. You've got to plan ahead. And you want to leave the lip mixture lean as much as, you po as much as you possibly can. And the reason you want to leave it lean is you're trying to keep cylinder temperatures up. You don't want to shock cool it. And of course, monitor the exhaust gas temperature and cylinder head temperatures. Try and keep those temp temperatures up. So think temperature management on engines, particularly turbocharged engines, which tend to run hot. You've got a long descent ahead of you when you're getting down. Here's another rule of thumb I think you'll find helpful in everyday flight. If you're on an ILS approach, your descent rate in feet per minute is approximately five times the ground speed in knots. Now that's for a standard three degree glide slope. Now here's, here's how that's going to help you. Let's assume that you have a 90 knot ground speed and you're on any kind of approach. It could be an ILS approach or just a normal approach to land at an airport. We would like to know what your rate of descent in feet per minute should be. You take the 90 knots and multiply it times five and you're going to get about 450 feet per minute. If you look up an exact three degree glide path, you'll find it's actually 480 feet per minute, but that's close enough. Now what that does for you is let's assume that you don't have an ILS glide slope to help you out and you want to know what feet per minute you should use in descent, take your ground speed, multiply times five, and that's going to give you a standard rate of descent from that airport, and that'll keep you from getting too low too soon and getting down into the trees before you're ready to land. Now all this helps illustrate the point that for any kind of approach, it's very wise to figure out the required rate of descent for the approach you're on. For instance, if you're going down a glide path and there's a tremendous headwind, you want to know what your rate of descent should be, otherwise you're liable to get too low. Here's another case where it's very important to know what your required rate of descent should be, and that is, let's assume you're making an approach to land at an airport, and it's a non-precision approach, and let's assume that the uh, decision height here, or minimum descent altitude for a non-precision approach, is 1,420 feet. Now let's assume that the altitude you fly just before your last step-down fix is 2,400 feet. That means you've got to lose 1,000 feet right here in this little three-mile distance. Now we said earlier it's important to think in terms of how many miles a minute your airplane is going when you're approaching the land. Well, if you have a 90-knot airplane, remember that you take this distance and divide by three and multiply by two, and that tells you how many minutes it's going to take you to get down for a 90-knot airplane. Well, in this case, you're going three miles, you divide by three and you cut one, multiply by two, and you're going to find it takes you two minutes to get down. You've got a thousand feet to, lay, uh, to lose. That means in order for you to be down to your minimum descent altitude in time to see the airport, you're gonna have to descend at at least 500 feet a minute. That's an important thing for you to calculate uh, before you do a non-precision approach at an airport so you know how fast you're gonna have to descend to be able to see anything when you get down there. Now let's talk about climbing above a turbulence layer. Another rule of thumb you need to know is if there is a turbulence layer, uh, you should climb above it if you can, even if you have to pick up a few knots of headwind. So what we're saying here is climbing above turbulence will make up for additional few knots of headwind because uh, if when you have a lot of turbulence, you've got a tremendous frequency of changes in your angle of attack, and these result in increased drag, and so it's worth it to go up above the turbulence if you can, even if you have to pick up a few knots of headwind. Good rule of thumb all across the board. Your passengers will appreciate it too. Now, let's talk about a trip, and the question is, what altitude should we fly on that trip? Let's assume you're going on a trip of about 100 miles. Well, a good rule of thumb is, if the climb to altitude in a normally aspirated aircraft will take more than 15% of the total in route time, that's as high as you want to go, stay at a lower altitude. So figure out what the total in route trip will take, how long it'll be, and let's assume it's gonna be two hours. Well, you wouldn't want to climb for any more than 15% of that as a rough rule of thumb. And that applies to most singles and light twins if they're normally aspirated. But now let's talk about what happens if today you're flying your turbocharged piston engine airplane. Well, when the engine's turbocharged, you want to get to a little higher altitude to take advantage of the fact that the airplane cruises a little faster at higher altitude. So on a turbocharged airplane, they say a good rule of thumb is you wouldn't want to spend any more than 25% of the total trip time climbing. And finally, if you're flying your 
turbojet airplane. Now, turbojets have a real problem because they really drink fuel at low altitudes and they become much more efficient at high altitudes. So turbojets especially, you really want to get to high altitude. So this good rule of thumb is you should not spend any more than 33% of the total trip time climbing. As a matter of fact, with a turbojet airplane, they recommend that for short trips, you spend one third of the cli time climbing, one third of the time cruising, and one third of the time descending. So once again, what are the rules of thumb for turbojet airplanes and for turbocharged? Let's take a look at turbocharged. Turbocharged, don't spend any more than 25% of the in-route time on a short trip climbing. And on a turbojet airplane, spend on a short trip about 33% of the total in-route time climbing. And finally, I've had a wonderful time talking with you about rules of thumb. Boy, oh boy, what a lot of information to remember, John. You're right, Martha, and the real trick is to remember it in the air when you need it, too. Well, if you can remember it in the air, I guess that means that you're going to be a superior pilot. Now, wait a minute. Hold the phone. What do you mean by a superior pilot? Come well, on. it's obvious. A superior pilot is one who uses his superior judgment to avoid situations that might require the use of his superior skill. <laughs> Martha, there's nothing left to say. I can't add anything to that. I hope you've enjoyed practical piloting as much as we've enjoyed putting it together. Have fun using these rules of thumb in your flying, and please, stay out of the trees. Win this magnificent Mooney! The speed, comfort, and easy handling of this exciting Mooney Special Edition can be yours. With its 200 horsepower Lycoming engine and refined aerodynamics, this Mooney Special Edition continues the legendary Mooney tradition of amazing speed and incredible efficiency. Inside this Special Edition, you'll find the finest deluxe interior and a spectacular Narco avionics package including the sensational Narco NS9000 StarNav, combining auto-scanning VOR and DME with GPS satellite navigation. Add in Narco's COM811, Mark 12 Plus NavCom, IDME 891, audio panel, and a Sentry 2000 2-axis autopilot with electric trim, plus Telex intercom with ANR headsets, and you've got it all! But to win, you must enter King School's newest Super Takeoff Sweepstakes. And your order of any King course automatically enters you to win. King Flight Test Courses prepare you for your check ride. An actual FAA examiner tells you what is expected for every task. And your instructor shows you how to demonstrate your knowledge on the ground and in the air. King's exciting takeoff videos take you beyond the written. Choose from a library of 13 informative and entertaining videos, including King's all-new Complete Airspace Review and the invaluable Communications. The highly acclaimed King Written Exam courses are always up to date and thorough and feature super monster graphics, 3D animation, and exciting live action video to make learning easy, interesting, and fun. After you've taken your King video course, let King's computerized exam review make it fun to ensure a Top Gun score. This easy to use program lets you choose questions by subject, select previously missed or unanswered questions, or take them all. Then receive on screen the correct answer and King's comprehensive detailed explanation at any time with the touch of a button. Your computer will track your progress, and King's report card highlights areas to concentrate on to improve your score. The practice exams display your test in exactly the same way you'll see it at the Sylvan Test Center. For instant written test results, call King to take your test on computer at one of Sylvan's more than 200 testing locations throughout the United States. You'll take your test in privacy, in a modern, comfortable environment, free from distractions that might break your concentration. And with the King Computerized Exam Review, you'll already have practiced with the Sylvan testing format. You know you'll do your best. Call King now to take your test on computer 
and you'll also receive the Right Stuff video for free. Order any video exam course and flight test course, and you'll also receive four additional takeoff videos of your choice, free from King Schools. But why not get it all? Order your video exam course and flight test course and get all 13 takeoff videos for only $99 more. Phone your order in now. Call 1-800-854-1001. That's 1-800-854-1001. And win this magnificent Mooney!